We're starting a new sermon series today entitled The Patriarchs. Patriarchs. <laughs> kind of has that Godfather look to it for those of y'all that are. The, the Patriarchs, listen, it goes back. Patriarchs, because you kind of wonder what is this patriarch? What does it mean? But it, it's the forefathers of our faith. If you want to get down to just kind of sum this up, the forefathers of our faith, we go back to Abraham. How many of you in church, when you were younger, you sang a song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm. Father Abraham had many sons. Left arm, right? It's like Christian hokey pokey for those that weren't a part of growing up in the church. You know, it's like it was a way for us to be active and singing a song and learning something. But I guess the question I would ask is, how many of you were actually taught what that song really means? I mean, Father Abraham has many sons. Who cares? So what, right? I mean, this is, this is the roots of our faith. It goes all the way back to Abraham, the promise that he was given, that from him generations would be blessed. And we're a part of that generation. So we want to look back to the forefathers. How many of you know it's better to learn things from other people's lives? Sometimes it's better to learn it from them than it is to have to do it yourself, right? But oh, how stubborn we are. We just want to learn it on our own, right? But this is our opportunity to look at the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and even moving up to Joseph and see some of these forefathers some of the things, their highs, the lows, the ebbs and flows, and see if there's anything that we can learn from their life that will speak to us today. So we're going to go to uh, Genesis. We're going to look at chapter 12. So if you go ahead and turn there. Chapter 12. We're going to do verse four, 1 through 4 to kick this off. When you get it, say, oh, I got it. Anybody else? Who's Still looking. Oh, I'm looking. Oh, I'm still trying to find it, right? Oh, I got it. Genesis chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, the Lord said to Abram, I'm going to do this real quick. I wrote some notes in another part of my Bible. Abram means high father, high father. His name was changed to Abraham, which means father of multitudes. The father of multitudes. Is it raining? Wow. Yes, praise the Lord, right? As long as it quits raining when we go down the river, because you know. <laughs> praise God for some rain. Abram, listen, Abram means high father. Abraham, father of a multitude. Sarai, which was Sarah's name originally. Sarai meant my princess. But her name was changed to Sarah, which means mother of nations. So it spoke to the promise. It spoke to the promise. For both, one, he would become the father of a multitude. She would become the mother of nations. So it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now let's just stop there for a second and see. He said, Leave your country, the place that you grew up. Leave your kindred. Leave your, leave your entire family, extended family, cousins, nieces, nephews, leave all of their kindred. And then it says, and your father's house, your immediate family as well. So you're heading out from that which you consider to be the norm, that which you consider to be comfortable. You're going to head out from there. So the father's house to the land that I will show you. Verse 2, and I will make you a great nation. And you have to understand, he is 75 years old at this point. We're going to see that in a second in verse 4. He's 75 years of age, and he's, they, they have no children. They have no children. This actually spans, uh, his, his life span is uh, 175 years. He dies at 175 years of age, and he doesn't even come on the scene in Scripture until he's 75 years old. That's where we're at, 75 years of age. And it says, And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And you get this, And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Why is that important? Because that's a patriarchal statement. It's a patriarchal statement. That 
the forefather of the faith, all families are going to be blessed in and through you and through your family. Phenomenal, right? Right? Verse 4. So Abram went. He took off. Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Or Haran. So uh, here's what you need to know about Abraham when it comes to Scripture. You can find his life from chapter 12 to chapter 25. Chapter 12 to chapter 25. So it's a handful, just a small amount of chapters that, that, shall we say, sum up only 100 of the 175 years of Abraham. So you're only seeing small snapshots in comparison to the entire life of Abraham and Sarah. Very, very small, minuscule amounts of his life in comparison to 175 years of life. And then he only comes on the scene at 75 years of age, so it's 100 years of life that's covered in this small amount of chapters. So there must be something about these chapters that speak about the life of Abraham. There's got to be. Uh, I have brought with me uh, one of many photo albums today. Many photo albums. How many of y'all have a lot of photo albums at the house, right? For those of you that are younger, this is how we used to do Facebook. <laughs> we used to take pictures, and we would put them in an album. I mean, we, and our pictures are actually, uh, they're not digital format. You can touch them. You can actually touch them. You, look, you, and you, can, you can pass them around a the room. It's crazy. It's just crazy stuff. Uh, but this is a very, very small amount of our life. Beth and I have been married, it'll be 22 years in November. We've known each other for 24 years in November. Uh, I'll be 45 in September. So over half of my life, I've had the honor of knowing Beth Nichols. And in that, this literally is weeks, maybe months of our entire life together, months of my life. It's just a snapshot of our life. Like here's some of the pictures that showed up in there. That was Ashley when she was little, and that was Eric when he was a baby. <laughs> Beth when she was a baby. As we were all extremely young then. Uh, this is the daughter that tomorrow I'll be driving back to college for her junior year in college. This was a lot of years ago, right? And, and you look at this, you go, so many things have changed. Her life, even the snapshots of Ashley's life, the snapshots of Daniel's, the snapshots of Morgan's. And now she's sitting by Lydia, and the two of them have been best friends since kindergarten. Just the snap snapshots of their lives, the woods, we've known them for years. And so you, you look at all of, those, all of those snapshots that you could possibly have, and God says, all right, out of all of these 175 years, I'm going to put these in chapter 12 through 25. Some of the things that show up. Well, first of all, i got to show you this picture just to embarrass my daughter. Come on. This. You can't tell me that ain't, that's cute, right? I mean, come on. That's adorable. All right, now we can move on. Um, at age 75, out of 175 years of age, at age 75, he comes on the scene in chapter 12. In chapter 12. At 100 years of age, Isaac is born. Sarah, or Sarai, Sarah was 90 years old when she conceived and gave birth to their son. That fulfillment of the promise that many nations will be blessed. 175 years he passes away, and that's in chapter 25. So that's just these little snapshots. But those aren't the only things that you see. If you look at, so just so you know, this week I read all of those chapters. Some of them more than once because some of them are extremely intriguing. I mean, they're, they're pretty cool. You get in there, you start reading them, you want to know the details. So you read them over and over again. So some of them I read multiple times. But I wanted to make sure that I read through every single one of those to get the highlights of his life. And here's some of the things that you saw. Forgive the, the, the alliteration. It's a pastor thing. Not everybody understands. But you have fa future, family, fears, failures, friends, foes, Pharaoh. See how that worked? Pharaoh still 
It sounds like an F, right? Or so you, you go through, these are some of the things. Now, this isn't, listen, not the total summation of even those chapters, but these are some of the things that can be highlighted. Like if you look at future, he talks about multitudes from you and from your family. Uh, he talks about his family leaving family, taking family. He took actually his, his immediate family, but also Lot came with him, and Lot was a nephew. So you see other family that's involved in these chapters. You see the fear that he has, this is no joke, he actually tells his wife to tell uh, the kings and the leaders that, that she is, uh, he, that basically he is my brother. Because at, get this, at 70 something years of age, she was that good looking. That he was, no joke. I mean, it's in there. I can just read it. Like, she was that fine, right? That she, he was concerned that he, would, that he would be killed because they would want to take his wife from him. And in two different occasions, they lie about that. So you see some failures. You see these fears that, that fuel the failures, right? Has anybody ever been there? Is your life on the screen right now? Because I know mine is. You have friends, uh, foes. You have all these interactions with other people that are occurring in this literally like Facebook posts of his life. Facebook posts, just quick snippets. Okay, so I got the flu. I, I didn't mean for it to start with F. Just go with me on this. But I, I got the flu. It was last fall. I think it was, and I've had, the, I've had the flu maybe three times in my life that I can recall. And one of them, when I was very young and I had the stomach flu, you don't want that, okay? That was awful. But this last year, I got the flu, and it had been years since I had had it. Uh, I, I went to a meeting. I go to the meeting, and I, I feel a little puny. And so throughout the day, I'm going, I I don't know what's going on. So I took that emergency. You know, you do everything you can to try to stay strong. And like, well, I, maybe it's just a sinus thing. Maybe it's, well, halfway through the day, I started to feel gradually, and gradually, it just felt worse and worse and worse. And by the end of the day, I felt like death warmed over. Just, I was sick. I knew I was sick. And so we had this dinner, this last dinner, and I'm thinking, man, I cannot get to my hotel fast enough because it was an overnight meeting. I was like, I can't get to my hotel fast enough. When I get to the hotel, that's when the, uh, the aches, the fever, the all the stuff, the sweats, everything that occurs with that onslaught of the flu, I got it. I couldn't hardly sleep that night. I was aching from head to toe. I got up in the morning, and I went, well, this isn't going away. So I text the people back at the meeting and said, I have to go to a walk-in clinic. I am not well at all. And so I went and got checked. And sure enough, I had, out of the two flus, I had one of them. I had, I think, A. Well, later on the week, my daughter got B. She ended up having both flus that year. She had, she was like, I'm just going to try them both out. We'll see what happens, right? Stronger than me. So I get the flu. Like I said, Three times, I'm, I'll be 45. I've probably had it three times in my entire life. But have you ever had those people that only remember you for one thing? You ever had that before? It's like just one thing occurred and then you've been labeled as that guy or that gal. So every time I send an email now to the people that I'm going to be meeting with, I mean, I've had three or four meetings since then. This is the kind of response I get. Thanks for responding, Eric. See you then. No flu allowed. Signed, the person who always brings up that one time that you had the flu. Has anybody ever been there before? Has anybody, you know what I'm talking about? It's like that one thing just keeps being brought up over and over and over. I don't, every, listen, I have emailed there three or four times and said, hey, I'm going to be at the meeting. And every single time they respond with, hey, it's great that you're coming. Don't bring the flu with you. Like I'm a constant carrier of the flu. But isn't that sometimes how we feel in regards to some of the things in our past? Isn't that how we feel in regards to some of the labels that we've put on ourselves or other people have put on us? Or, or, or maybe even, maybe they don't even tell you that. You just feel like they're thinking it. Right? You ever been there before? Well, I was looking at Hebrews chapter 
11, and we'll go to that in a second. And here's what I found. In regards to the life of Abraham, all the things that could be remembered by God, you know the thing that he focuses in on? Faith. Out of all the things that he has, I mean, now granted, we have just snapshots, but God knows all 175 years of his life chooses to only put these in the Scripture from Genesis chapter 12 through 25. And then Hebrews chapter 11, he points out the thing that I remember him for is his faith. That gives me a little bit of an assurance. How about you? Isn't it a blessing to know that there is, you don't have to be remembered by all of those labels. You don't have to be remembered by your past. You go, but the last two weeks, Pastor Eric, you've been talking about choices and you are a summation of your choices. Can I tell you, I've struggled with using that terminology because here's what I know. There's only one choice that really matters when it comes down to it. And that's what do you do with this Jesus? And then what happens is we're blessed by his choice. And what was his choice? To set us free from our past. Amen? So the most important decision today is, will I have faith in Him? And will I follow Him? Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11? He's remembered for His faith. I want us to look at this. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to go to the New Testament. And and it's brought up all of these people of faith. And Abraham, obviously, is one of them. In verse 8... By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance as his inheritance. So verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Well, then you go, okay, well, what exactly is this thing faith? Because I want that in my life. Does anybody else want some of that? I mean, I want to know what this faith is. Well, here's what I love about Scripture. God, this is what I love about God. There are some, some things where He's not going to leave it out there for the world to define it. He actually gives us the, the definition of faith in verse 1 in Hebrews. He specifically tells us, this is what faith is. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Now, I'm going to continue reading, and I'll come back to that. It says, for by it the people of old received commendation. It says, by faith, now this, is, this helps us understand faith. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. Let me repeat that. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. That which is invisible becomes sight. You go, well, what is this thing? Of, what does faith really mean? How do, I don't know if I understand that definition. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Can I tell you that this week the Lord woke me up repeating that through my head and in my heart? The first part of this definition. I could not get that out of my head. I was literally awakened in the middle of the night and I kept hearing not just the assurance, but the certainty, certain of things that are hoped for. And so I want to clarify this for you. Oftentimes, we put faith and hope in the same camp. We look at them as almost the same thing. Because I, I hope for an outcome, I'm having faith. This goes further. This isn't just a light at the end of the tunnel. This is a, I know that we're going to get to the end of the tunnel. I'm going assur- to oh, prove it to you. It's the assurance of things hoped for. I think God did that on purpose. Faith isn't just about hope. Hope is very much a part of our faith. But what he's saying is you are certain of the thing that you hope for. Can I give you an illustration? So, this side says it's okay. Is it okay with you? All right. Can I give you an illustration? So the illustration is this. So many times I have heard people of, from different churches that have stated, I hope that I get to heaven. I just hope that I get there. But can I tell you, I am assured that I will get there. Hello, I'm talking to you now. 
Because the, some of you need to understand the difference between faith and hope. Some of you need to understand that God has called us to be people of faith. And what that means is, yes, we have a hope, but we know that we're going to get where we need to go. Abraham took off. Do you realize that he didn't know where the next step was going to be, but he knew he would get where he needed to go, didn't even know where it was, right? He just said, God said, go, head in that direction, and I'm going to show you. Because he was certain of what he had hoped for. He knew that he would get to that destination. It actually goes on a little bit further if you, if you keep reading about the inheritance. It says, and he went out not knowing where he was going by faith. He went to live in a land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of him of the promise. Now, if you go down to verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having, get this, not having received them, but having seen them. It's the convictions of things not seen. In their own spirit, they already saw this inheritance. But look at this. It says, And greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking. Come on. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. You realize that we have a home in eternity? We have, a, we have a hope for eternity, but we can be assured of our hope. We can be certain that we have eternity. You say, well, that's pretty brash of you to say that you know that you're going to go to heaven. Can I tell you, that's not because of anything that I did. It's because of what he did. It is a gift of God. It's eternal life. It's a gift of God. It's not of anything that I did. Otherwise, I'd be bragging about it. It's by grace through, talk to me people, it's by grace through faith. The assurance of these things that we're hoped for. I don't know about you, but um, I think sometimes in our life, our faith needs a fresh start. Am I talking to anybody? I think sometimes in our life, we need a fresh start. We need, we, we just need, okay, have you ever said, oh, me of little faith? Because I have. Have you ever said, oh, God, help me with my unbelief? Because I have. So I think sometimes we just, this is what I love about God. He says his mercy is new every single day. And I know without a doubt that this message has burned within my heart all week long because there's somebody in this room that needs a fresh shot of faith. You just need a fresh start. All that stuff in the past, it's in the past. But today, you can make a choice. Right now, you can make a choice to pursue him with all that you are and say, you know what, God, wherever you take me, I know you're going to get me there. <laughs> Amen? Some of you have been holding on to these dreams for a job, family, that's that and the other. Can you know, do you know you can trust him with that? You can have faith that he's got that? 